All right, Kathy, would you like to go ahead and introduce Dan? Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy Chorba, and I'm with the California Telehealth Resource Center, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the National Telehealth Webinar Series, which is presented by the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. As many of you already know, the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers consists of 12 resource centers across the United States. Each resource center represents a, a different region. And we also have two national telehealth resource centers, one national resource center for policy and one resource center for technology. Technology is TTAG located up in Alaska and the policy is the CCHP, which is located in California. Today's webinar is Network Connectivity and Telemedicine and the Harsh Truth of the Public Internet, Wireless Cellular Access, and et cetera, et cetera, which is presented by my friend and colleague, Daniel Kurachek, with the California Telehealth Network and telemedicine.com. And at this point, I'll turn this over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on to the first slide here. And... Not moving. Just click anywhere on the screen. There we go. Yeah, it's a little bit of a delay I think we've got going on here. Anyway, so who am I? Uh, I've actually, uh, like Kathy, have about 20 years experience in telemedicine and was actually director of the telemedicine uh, technology a program at UC Davis. I saw about 11,000 patients in 35 different specialties, done everything from PICU, NICU, ER, OR, robotic surgery, prisons, probably you, you name it on, on that different level of even uh, uh, hospitals and clinics with no running water or electricity to over 800 bed hospital systems. And I've got two patents in telemedicine system design uh, within the field of telemedicine and was also the director of the telemedicine learning center at the university. Uh, where probably by the time I left the university, I trained well over 800 clinicians on how to start and develop their own telemedicine program. After leaving the university, I went to Intel Corporation and worked with them worldwide in developing uh, telemedicine devices like the ones you see on the screen here and um, assist with projects globally for Intel Corporation. And probably about 10 years ago is when I left uh, Intel and started uh, telemedicine.com. And uh, within telemedicine.com, my goal there was to actually be your single resource to be able to help hospitals and clinics globally around the world. And I'm telling you all this background piece of information, not so much uh, that you go, ooh, ah, he's been all over the world. It's more so that me, just like all their fellow tech guys and gals that are on watching right now is uh, the first thing I always say is uh, what credentials does this person have for telling me uh, of how to run my system or ideas, right? I don't know it all and I, um, and I would love to hear your questions and throughout Kathy is going to be on here pulling up your questions. So please feel free. I'd love to hear from you guys as we go through this and answer question, any questions you may have. So um, I've done projects uh, probably well over two, 300 in the US, uh, Brazil, China, India, Lebanon, Nigeria, South Africa, South Korea, and very challenging as far as how do we get these broadband issues where uh, sometimes we're going WiMAX, so satellites, uh, everything from every wireless and wired topology imaginable trying to get these different regions to work. And so I'll, uh, I'll use, be using that experience to talk about here as far as what's the easiest way to get that functioning for everybody watching today. So <clears throat> let's start with the first quote of the day. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler by Albert Einstein. So with that, I think before we can uh, communicate effectively all on the same page, I want to level set uh, with some definition so we're all on the same page when I refer to some of these terms. So we all uh, use the terms telemedicine and telehealth. I want to just say, state for this talk the word telemedicine. I'm using it in this sense right here you're seeing on the screen. 
my buddy, Dr. Jim Morrison. He's in the PICU at UC Davis Medical Center, and he's connected up to hospital that's many, many hours away from him. He's assisting the physician on the far side live via video and assisting her with her patients there. Um, and the other modality that I want to talk about besides live real time is our ability to do storm forward. And this is Dr. Peter Yellowlees. And what he's doing is storing forward. So people sending him images, whether it's radiology, um, any types of vitals, types of information, uh, information that can be sent over storing forward. A physician like Dr. Yellowlees um, can actually review it at their leisure and diagnose and treat and send back that information, uh, usually HIPAA compliant, password protected software. So just a level set when I'm talking about telemedicine, I'm either talking about live real time or store and forward capability. All right, so let's move on to telemedicine technology 101. And unfortunately, I can't see you guys usually when it's a tech talk time. It's when people pull out a pillow and go for a little nap. Um, uh, but last time I did a talk like this, I told everybody I could see you and I got way too many emails and, and questions. You really could see me and people are just kind of freaking out. So I won't say I could see you this time. I cannot see you. Uh, you can only see me, but uh, let's move forward with this. And anybody that's in a room with somebody else that's nodding off, uh, please uh, tap them on their shoulder. So it's like some of the biggest myths I hear all the time in telemedicine. And I got to be honest with you, it drives me absolutely nuts when I hear this because I'll go in a boardroom or a large meeting room and the first thing somebody will say of a management um, position will go, hey, you know, technology just works. Let's talk about operations and let's talk about putting this program together. It's the furthest thing from the truth. Technology, yes, it's got a lot easier over the last 20 years. You know, we've seen it just extremely difficult in the early years. Has it gotten easier? Yes. But technology only works when you understand what systems you have in place and what systems you're trying to connect to, what medical peripherals you want to connect to it, and does it work with your devices. So doing your due diligence is incredibly important on understanding technology and telemedicine and, even more importantly, making sure it works for your consultations, okay? So the first thing, let's talk about what is the LAN. So the LAN is the local area network. And this is within, it could be within your office space, the floor of your building, it could be your entire building. Anytime it's connecting computers and PCs together, printers, whatever it might be, anywhere within your building, or even buildings that are close together. That is your local area network. And Opposed to that is our WAN, which is our wide area network. So as you can see in the images, if you're going beyond a mile or so further away from buildings, that's the wide area network that connects those two. So what's the world's largest wide area network that we use every day? The internet, right? So it connects us from all different locations, but you can actually have your own private WAN connecting you to each other. Here's the caveat that I've seen over the last several years of visiting hundreds of hospitals and clinics is that the biggest issue is that the, um, the LAN may actually be the barrier than the WAN. And what do I mean by that? Um, um, uh, no, that's okay. Um, so with the WAN, the WAN speeds have gotten so much faster now that I've seen it to where they're actually faster than the land speeds inside of a building. And what's interesting, I've gone into sites where they're like, well, hey, you know, we just connected up with this high speed network and it's still horrible. Once we actually go in there and look at the speeds within the local building or local office area or clinic or hospital, a lot of times because that WAN speed has gotten so much faster, not that the internet's faster, it's more our private networks that we've put in place. Uh, and I'll talk more about that too, have gotten so much faster that I've seen it the, where the LAN is actually the, the culprit in a lot of those problems. And we'll even talk about other problems that could be a cause in that. So to hit this home, if I've got a hospital in California, I want to connect up to a hospital in New York, that wire, that connection between those two different hospitals or clinics is the WAN. So make sure we're all together on the same page here. So <clears throat> moving forward, and I know we're at this step where, where all I know is I know nothing. <laughs> so, but how do I know? Uh, and as we move forward, hopefully all this will start coming together and making the big picture, right? We're going to start from the 30,000 foot level and start narrowing it down. 
So now let's get even closer, which is what is bandwidth? And bandwidth for all of us doing telemedicine is incredibly important. So this piece, uh, pay close attention to because this is one of the culprits of allowing us to be able to have high quality communication to each other. Bandwidth is the maximum amount of data, usually measured in bits per second, that can travel a communications path in a given time. So what do I mean by that? I like putting pictures up. So if I took this computer, it's got one wire connected to the other computer there, and I took a speedometer, I stabbed that wire, and I want to see how fast it's transmitting data between those two. That's bandwidth. Why is it so important for us in telemedicine? Well, the reason is, is because the higher the bandwidth, uh, the better results of quality of image, right? We can, if the higher we actually have a quality guaranteed bandwidth, we now can connect at higher speeds. Higher speeds means higher resolution. Higher resolution means better audio, better video, less, less of the pixelation, which I'll show you an image of what pixelation looks like, drop out of the voice. I'm sure some of you have done different video conferencing where you hear that uh, 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 when you're speaking, and that's because of dropouts. The better the bandwidth is, the less of those images are. And I gotta be really uh, clear, that in telemedicine, unlike when you use video conferencing meeting with family and friends, one or two times tops and most physicians will, and patients won't ever want to use it again. So doing your due diligence early and making sure these components and pieces are in place is critical. Next piece, and this is a very, very important piece because utilization is critical and why is that because just like on the slide here and what utilization means is the amount of traffic that network compared to its peak how much it can support and how much is going through it so like the image on the left hand side we've got i don't know six twelve lanes of freeway they're going through like if someone of your tech person saying hey don't worry we got 10 megs here we got 100 megs we got a gig switch going through our hospital clinic that's fine, but the problem is if the utilization is up over 95% or 80% even, forget it. Your video is not going to pass through. So this is some of the biggest things I see too as well is folks will say, don't worry, we're set. And uh, we got this much bandwidth coming through. It's very important to have your tech folks or tech folks that are online Check the utilization of seeing how uh, how an impact it is that network in between the sites are and within your local actual area network as well. Okay. The last component on this section of this slide is QoS. And what does QoS stand? It stands for quality of service. And what this allows us to do, whether your, your network is impacted or not, your utilization is really high or not, what we can actually do is we can invoke QoS, quality of service, on our video packets. So let's pretend all these cars over here are email and surfing the web and whatever else folks are doing in the office. Whether their email gets there three seconds later than it normally would without the video on QoS, Nobody notices it, right? But they sure notice if the video drops and all of a sudden my voice and video totally goes away. So what we're able to do is kind of like give it its own ride share lane, right? So they could actually go in. So the video packets now have a free range to cut through and be able to go from point A to point B. So something else to look at to see if you can invoke QoS within your network for video packets to be able to transmit through. And that's really beneficial too, as far as allowing you to at least get the highest possible outcome for your telemedicine uh, communication. So let's talk about this word internet and how does it actually work and, and why it's a barrier. It's a great thing for most things, right? Surfing the web we do every day. But why, for me, in, in the space of telemedicine, it's a barrier? Well, the word internet is broken up in two different words. Inter, meaning connected, and net, short for networks. So just like you see on the slide here, if I'm here in California and I want to send my video call to New York City over here, it's actually jumping and hopping all these different networks going through each other's backyards to get from point A to point B. And that's exactly how the internet works. So with that being said, let's talk about my next big myth in telemedicine, which I always say, hey, if you want to do telemedicine over the internet, this must be your motto in your office. Please have a seat. The doctor will see you in a couple minutes or not at all. 
right? So not, not a great motto and uh, not going to make your patients very happy, right? But here is why. And I'm telling you, even with a lot of tech folks in a room and we have screaming matches and I have to do it on a whiteboard and explain this, but this is the truth and reality of how this works is that when you purchase your internet connectivity, whether it's one meg, a hundred megs, a gig, whatever that is, it's kind of like your private on-ramp to the internet, right? It gets you there directly to what we would call the freeway up here, which is the internet. So it's beautiful, right? I can get there really fast, really quick speed up to it because I'm just going to the central office, whoever your provider is. The problem is once I'm on this freeway up here on the internet, the internet's cyclical. Nobody on this planet controls the speed of the internet. And if anybody tells you, and I've seen it time and time again, oh, we have software, we control it, we do a VPN, we do all these different things, and I will talk about VPNs because people always talk about how VPNs make the internet faster. It's not true, and I will show you why. Um, and all these different things have, uh, that I've seen over the years of people saying they've got ways to, to beat the internet, and not true. Um, Hey, I go out to the freeway here. Sometimes it could be two in the afternoon. It's beautiful out. Next day, two in the afternoon, to stand still, right? Because there's an accident or whatever going on there. No different whatsoever with the internet. And because of that cyclicalness, just like the slide previously, the doctor will see in a couple of minutes or not at all because sometimes it's a beautiful connection, sometimes not so good if you're going over the internet. So what's some of the issues you might have over the internet? Just like you see in this image here, because no one controls the speed of the internet, whether you have one gig or I have 100 gigs to the internet, hey, it's like this Ferrari sitting here in standstill traffic, right? And the Suburban's in front of them. Who's quicker? Neither, right? I mean, that's the barrier once you're on the actual internet. You may experience calls that can drop at any time. The other thing, major delays in transferring large images, right? I'm transferring whether it's ultrasound videos or CT scans that are, you know, huge files. It could take hours and hours to do over the internet. We're a private network. We could do it within minutes. You'll experience things like lip sync loss, right? Remember the old kung fu movies where the lip syncs don't match. And talk about trying to do mental health and doing other uh, consultations like that. Extremely difficult when the lip sync doesn't match while the person's talking. And last but not least is pixelation, right? This is horrible. Uh, you're trying to see a lesion on somebody's skin and it looks like that or on this person's face. How are you going to diagnose and be able to see that? So it's an issue there too as well. Okay. But now, can anyone create a new internet and not use the internet? Sure, because all internet means, right, is connections of networks. So what we did here in the state of California to override this problem that we were having is we were able to get a grant from the FCC. And uh, it was about, I think, with matching funds, about $30 million here in the state. And I'm not touting I join the C10 and do all this nationwide because it's just a we're not, uh, not for profit and we just did this to help this problem of the internet between each other. So what we did was create an MPLS high speed backbone internet for our, our uh, clients and members. And now over 300 hospitals and clinics connect up to this backbone. So whether you're at the top of the state, uh, up in Mount Shasta, connecting to the bottom of the state over here by Colexico, we could instantly, just by giving your IP address, connect up and never experience those problems I talked about before, pixelation, lip sync loss, uh, calls dropping, all of those types of issues because we're now guaranteeing that bandwidth. So now instead of connecting at low speeds like 384,000 bits per section, sec uh, second, we're actually able to connect up over 1 million bits per second or two or six. So phenomenal, beautiful quality videos and connections. And then these pesky things came out to be a lot more stronger and faster. And the, pro, the pros of these guys were great, right? They finally laptops and desktops and all these things started getting much, much faster um, as far as processing power. So we could do video conferencing on them, a lot less expensive in, you know, much lighter. I could throw my lab coat and now all clinicians and folks in offices said, hey, Dan, can we start using these to do telemedicine? Majority of time, yes, if you're the specialty side, usually with the patient side, it's much harder to connect medical devices. And as Bluetooth medical devices are come around, sure, we'll use it more at the bedside. 
But the problem was a lot of these applications on these devices, whether it was iOS, or iOS which is Apple or Android type systems, or operating systems, they require the cloud, right? So things like we're all familiar with, right? Um, well, I go on to this application, and what does the cloud actually mean? Somewhere in this country or in this world, not in your location, is a server that runs the software, right? So just like in this application here where I talked about the CTN that we had our private, beautiful, high-speed network, but now we got clinicians using these devices connecting up to the cloud. Well, the problem is, just like you see in the slide here, it leaves this beautiful WAN, which was the CTN, and each of these LANs were over 300 of them, and by next year we're going to have over 1,000 hospitals connected up in the state. Problem is, is that once they leave our our beautiful secure network foundation, you're back to the internet again. So sometimes people are saying, this works great, or sometimes this is horrible, and how come it doesn't work well, and you said the CTN's going to work great. had nothing to do with us. had to do with them leaving our network to be able to do cloud services. So let me show you what that looked like in our case. So within the backbone there, these arrows are pointing to any location around the country, right? And there's thousands of them, servers all over the country, and where these software um, run from. So it's great. I don't have to run it in-house. It runs from somebody else. But keep in mind, um, if I'm calling across the street, say, for instance, but the server is back here in Chicago, I'm leaving California, goes to Chicago, comes back to California so I can call across the street. Not the best use of my data plan, right? So sometimes it might work great, sometimes horrible, depending upon that traffic there and back. So um, nothing bad about cloud services. We still use them today, but it's something, and I'll talk about more of the tips of how you can utilize these services better to your advantage. So what we ended up doing is an allowed cloud services will allow you to do this if you want to do like we did. We removed this cloud services at different locations where we didn't know where they were. We purchased a cloud service software, put it on our backbone, and now anybody using iPads, iPhones, smart technology, laptops, whatever they're using, now connect up to that same beautiful high-speed network between each other, and now they can do all those same tools without ever worrying about it not being a good quality connection between the sites, okay? Now, this comes up all the time. But Dan, if, I, if the internet's not working so well, I'm going to use the cellular, uh, my new technology, my high speed, and be able to use, I get 3G, 4G, 5G. You know, <laughs> the problem is this. I don't care if it goes to 100G or a million G. The problem is, is that just like in this scenario, since we already showed the image of the CTN backbone, here's the backbone of the CTN. Here's the internet for homes and hospitals and clinics. If we want to connect to them, we have to connect outside the CTN and go out to the internet and go meet them if they're not members of the CTN. This could be anywhere in the world, right? I'm just showing this just for state purposes, make it easier to understand. Now, I connect up with my phone and I'm connecting up. Here's the problem. It goes directly to the cellular tower there. That connects up to the internet and then from the internet back over to you. So it's just like the scenario here where it's going to connect up to the tower. I don't care if it connects up between your phone and the tower at five gig. It's saying, you know, you're, you're connecting up at, uh, you know, gigabit or even someday there's 100 gigs and this is a 100 gigabit connection between your phone, right? We can't do that nowadays. But if it does say that, all that is is saying you're connected between your phone to the tower at that speed. It still drops down. There's wires that go into the dirt and go and connect somewhere to the internet and then still traverse. So the internet is still in that model. And so I hear this a lot that people are going to use cellular and they're going to be able to beat the issues with the internet by using cellular. You're really not. And I want to point that out. So I get this all the time. So um, tech people are not usually the most shy. So I usually get, that's so not true, Dan. My internet connection is great and I can prove it to you because I can watch HD streamed movies without a problem ever. And so, <laughs> so then, uh, uh, you know, here's where I have to clarify what does that mean and why is that true? And they are correct. You could watch streamed without a problem versus the rest of us that are having problems. Why is that? Well, it comes down to another definition. Let's talk about what is half duplex versus full duplex. Half duplex is just like, remember when we were kids, although 
you know, we could say when we were kids, we had walkie talkies, but I guess young kids can't say that. They got cellular phones by the time they were three. Uh, so that's a, a missing dying hour. I might have to change my slide another five years. But anyway, for those of us, most of us on the call, we remember walkie talkies, right? You had to press the button, you speak, you let go of the button, you wait to hear a response. That's half duplex. Both can't talk at the same time, either you're listening or you're talking, right? Um, then there's full duplex. Now, like telephones, we can actually talk to each other. We have a great argument, right? Because we can both talk over each other and we can hear each other at the same time. That's full duplex. And just like with my buddy, Dr. Jim Marson, having his video conferencing, full duplex. He's able to talk, the doc's able to talk back and forth and be able to talk over each other and be able to communicate effectively instead of waiting and, and each other talking. And I gotta tell you, 20 years ago, we were doing this to prove if a system was full duplex, because a lot of them weren't, one of us would say the alphabet and the other one would say numbers, right? And so what we would be able to do is go, did you hear my numbers while I was saying the alphabet and vice versa? And that's how we'd prove it was a full duplex communication, okay? And so Netflix or any of these uh, downloading service to be able to get that, um, to be able to communicate with that connection works like this. So we'll actually, um, how streamed movies work. I don't care what service you use. Basically what happens is, is that network right there of the video is online somewhere, somewhere in the planet. You on your computer chose to watch that movie. So inside the hard drive, what it's doing, and I'm sure like any movie you've seen, usually has a clock cone or something moving on the screen. That entire time, it's actually taking the movie and putting it on the hard drive, whether it's one minute, 10 minutes, whatever it is before the movie starts. Once the movie starts, it's got a collection of this buffered film here. So if there's a glitch, and trust me, there will be a glitch, you don't see it because that buffered information is constantly taking the movie here, sending it up to the monitor over and over again as you're watching the movie. And that's how come you're able to watch this. And I've had a lot of docs come up to me. That's ridiculous. We can watch HD movies, no problem here. And I, that doesn't make any sense. Well, the difference is, is that within telemedicine, we're full duplex, not half, right? We're not only in this scenario, I'd have to be sending up a movie the same time I'm downloading a movie at the exact same time, and which does not apply to this, okay? The next really big culprit, and I see this time and time again, is wired versus wireless, okay? If you're in a building and you have wireless, that's great. Communicating email, like we talked about, it just sends and who cares what, you know, if it's a minute or two later after somebody receives it. In video though, remember we're full duplex. It matters incredibly important how fast that connection is going up versus down and at the same time. Well, just like in this scenario here, and the winner is by knockout in the first round, wired defeats wireless. And I'm telling you, Nine times out of 10, when somebody's calling with an issue or a problem, I'll ask them, hey, are you connected wired or wireless in your, in your clinic office? Oh, we're using the wireless network. Plug it in wired, all of a sudden it all goes away. And I do understand some sites you don't have that luxury. And I'll talk a little bit about more about getting a hospital grade spectrum analysis and putting in a really high quality wireless system. Because sure, it'll work surfing the web, it'll sure work doing uh, your emails and those types of situations but live video nonstop at those kind of high speeds, nine times out of 10, you're introducing major problems. And I know there's some folks out there that always go, I don't know if that's really true, Dan, let's see. So the next phase is a lot of people talk about speed tests and I'll talk to you a little bit more about the pros and cons of speed tests. I honestly don't like speed tests to tell you the true speed of your location because speed tests um, send a very small, tiny bit of data, and it travels to wherever their server is and measures that and how quick it comes back and how much data it can calculate of that information that it's being able to transmit and send from to and from your location. The other problem is, and uh, I've heard a lot of this, depending upon which speed test site you use, they check your IP address, and if you're not a member of their program or their um, um, broadband service, a lot of times they'll report you're slower than they normally would anyway. But it's a great tool for comparative, and why is that? Because I can go wired, like I did in this test, to, did my speed test, it showed 180 meg download speed. 
A minute later, turned on, uh, unplugged the wire, went wireless, and it dropped from 180 megs download speed to 28. So at least comparative, whether that was accurate and that speed up and down in the trust me, it's not because there's no way I'm going to be able to connect over a 180 meg, meg video call between two people and have it work over the internet. It's impossible. It's not going to work, at least not nowadays. And then I went to a different site and did the exact same test because I know people like me, tech folks who always go, mm, maybe it was this or maybe it was that. So I went to a completely different site, tested again, same kind of results as far as reduction of that wireless. And trust me, if you can, pennies on the dollar to go in your exam room and put extra ethernet cables into each one of your rooms so you're able to do that so the issue i have with the speed test is this just because it slams up there quickly connects up like the scenario gave you a motorcycle is much easier to traverse through traffic right little tiny piece versus a big semi going through traffic and that's what a speed test does right you're not gonna sit there for an hour and send a huge file to really get the true test of your speed because that's really what it would take an uncompressed file, very large, send it between two locations. That's the only way. And you'd have to time that to get really true speed and then measure that uh, bandwidth between those two locations of did it really work. But it's like this bug here, right? Speed test come back showing me that just because the speedometer shows 200 miles an hour doesn't mean that my 1968 bug can do 200. Uh, maybe if I dropped it out of a helicopter or something and it's going downhill or something and flying towards the ground, right? That could be an issue there. Uh, and that's the only way I'd probably be able to get it to go 200 miles an hour. So, you know, just the speed test itself, don't, don't rely on that. Um, it, there's many of them out there. Go on Google or any search engine you want and do speed test and you can try, your, try it yourself. The other things I like to use speed test for is comparative, like I talked about before. Time of day usage. If you are and you have to use the internet, you will notice that the speed does vary, whether it's eight o'clock, noon, 4 p.m., after 6 p.m., because you know the more people are out there using, right? You'll notice during the summer, it's a lot worse because school kids are out of school and they're surfing the web a lot more. You'll notice at lunchtime that it's slower too as well. So you could use it to, to uh, do an analysis of your location to see if you're affected by that or not, right? And it generally is depending upon where you are, who you're connecting to. So this is more of a, just a scenario at your location. Are you going to experience something? And you could do comparative results to be able to do that. So it's kind of nice to do a speed test to just see that um, communication. So what is a virtual private network? And I talk about this because I hear this a lot that people will say, hey, well, I'm working with somebody that is, um, says they can actually connect up a VPN. It's a virtual private network over the internet and it's much faster. Well, the reality is it isn't. What, what, and I trust me, I believe in VPNs and everybody that's ever using the internet and sharing data, please set up a VPN between your two different locations. Why? Because what it does is right now in this scenario, if I was connecting between this hospital and this hospital, we learned that data transfers over from network to network. Some smart person could be going through that network and sniffing that line and capturing that data between those, those two hospitals and those two regions if it's over the internet, right? The VPN creates this tunnel from one end to the other end and it encrypts that data. So even if somebody saw, oh, I see a stream, let me get break into that. It's encrypted, they can't get access to it. Um, but it does not speed up your capability across the internet. If anything, it's gonna slow it down, to be honest with you. But it's a very useful tool for those of you that are on the internet, and I highly recommend setting VPNs if you're connecting between hospitals or clinics and you're going over the internet, um, so that. But I just wanna make sure that you understand that's all a VPN does for you, a couple other things, but it's not gonna improve your speed over the internet, okay? So, uh, let's take a look at some telemedicine broadband technology tips, uh, okay? So, to recap, and we're starting from probably the most problematic things down to the least problematic, is definitely use a wired connection if possible. Like I said, go into a clinic room, try to get somebody to put an ethernet drop in there and be able to connect up that system so it's wired versus wireless, okay? If you have to go wireless, 
get some folks in there that are wireless experts and bring in um, those systems in. And they use a spectrum analysis system. I know everybody's got an app on their phone that shows when the wireless signal's weak and they put another access point. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about truly being able to do layer three roaming between uh, access point to access point to where it's phenomenal quality between those two. So that way that's not the, the problem in your connectivity, okay? The other thing you could do is try to connect up if you got one or two sites and you're using the internet now and you're experiencing those problems, try to contact your phone company or your data uh, company or cable company and see if you could purchase what's called a dedicated leased line. I obviously wouldn't do this for the whole state. It cost you millions and millions of dollars, right? But to be able to connect up, if you have one site that I only connect up with and they, hey, it's only going to cost me $500 a month and I never have to deal with problems, in essence, you're kind of creating the, the same kind of scenario we did across the state of California with our backbone. Um, and so what you could do is purchase any one of these, these types and there's a lot more to choose from to be able to get you connected up so it's dedicated point to point. Um, is it going to improve your connectivity to other folks? No. It's kind of like you know the, the cup and string model where you're just connecting that dedicated lease line from you to that other location, but at least that connectivity is beautiful. If you do need to use the internet and be able to connect up, a couple of things you could try. These high-end video conferencing units, which usually we use by the bedside, or you know, it's video conferencing units that instead of using software, we're actually using hardware. These have software built into them. So all you have to do is get the IP address or the SIP address for the other person on the other side, and that actually can connect you. So that scenario of you're connecting with somebody that's just a mile away from you, hey, using a point-to-point -point solution might get you better odds over the internet because it's not going to some server somewhere in the world. It's just going from point A to point B, okay? However, if you are a specialist or doctor reviewing the information from one of these cards, hey, use a laptop. And there is known as um, SIP and H323 aware software. So you just install it doesn't use any cloud services. It connects exactly like I'm on my laptop here. I could talk to any one of these um, higher end video conferencing type carts and instantly connect them without a server in that, within that space. Generally, if you're close together, right, that's where we'd want to be able to use a point to point type service. However, you're connecting to many different sites or you're like, Dan, I could be using any dock anywhere in the state. Cloud services are the way to go with this one, right? Because I'm going to be going over the internet and doing this. I don't want to have to support this. It's very expensive to put these in. You have staff in house. These work great for that. Um, the one thing I will tell you is their servers are all over the country or all over your state or wherever you might be. So when you're comparing services, try each different one because the point from where you are connecting to the sites you're connecting to their server may be closer or further away from you. So the latency doesn't mean it's going to be every time great, right? We're just trying to get the best odds of success because we are using the internet and internet cyclical. But if you are using cloud service, compare them and do tests between you and the folks you're connecting to and try each different cloud services um, offering to see which one worked best. But the key is just like you saw earlier, try it at different times too, 8, noon, 3 p.m. because your neighborhood might be the culprit of the effect of the, the internet speed might be slow in your area that moment in time too, okay? So whether you're using a point-to-point -point software or cloud service for video conferencing, um, telemedicine over the internet, follow these rules, okay? So I've got a really high-end video conferencing system like I talked about here with the CTN connected from point to point with a guaranteed bandwidth. I can make a two megabit call and it's phenomenal, high definition, beautiful. But if I'm using the internet, whether I'm using cloud services or whether I'm using point to point with H323 or SIP aware software, I always recommend 512 kilobits or slower. The problem is the internet, you're almost guaranteeing a problem once you hit a meg. At some point of that constellation, unless it's two minute call, you're gonna run into degradation and get some pixelation, lip loss, 
call drop some of those types of issues because the internet just can't sustain. Now we understand what full duplex is, a full duplex call continuously. And we're talking about when it's one meg, we're talking one million bits of information up and down continue. That's a lot of information, okay? So you start at 512K. If it still looks kind of bad, drop it to 384. If 384 um, is not working for you, 256 at the very least, you drop below that, I guarantee lip loss um, because of the um, how slow that is and the amount of data we really need to be able to do that to connect up between each other. So it's something to try for. Now, for those of you that are using cloud services, some cloud software don't give you a choice of 512, one meg or whatever. But if you click on the gear or you click on their properties or something, sometimes it'll have high, medium, or low connectivity of video quality. And that's all they're doing is changing the bandwidth there. Or you could talk to them and say, hey, can you lower my bandwidth because I'm having issues between these two sites. Okay. Some of the things to be aware of on, on the telemedicine technology tips is some smart devices can only be used wirelessly. And is that an issue for you, right? We get some of these smart devices that there's no way to plug a wired connection in. So if you're experiencing that, or they only will use cellular connectivity. Well, I'm telling you, I've had sites get a grant and go, Dan, we just bought 50 of these specific smart devices, and I won't say which one it was, and we're ready to go, and we want to connect up, and we want to do ENT, and we want to hook up an otoscope to it, and, and we want to be able to connect up. I'm sorry, you can't do that. For one, the scopes can't connect to it yet because there was no Bluetooth capability there, so we couldn't connect the radical peripheral. But the other thing, when we tested it, you know, in their region of doing cellular connectivity directly from where they wanted to connect to the other side, it wasn't viable. And so, wow, we just spent all that money and all that, that um, you know, it's so difficult to get a grant. Here's where the due diligence of test, test, and test again. And talk to other folks that are doing this because they could tell you some of their experiences and go, hey, just watch out for this. And, and that's what we're here for. And that's what the TRC is here for is to be able to help answer those questions for you too. And for your very last tip is please <laughs> uh, don't tell your tech team, and I've heard this too many times, hey, I've set up a wireless system in my house in just 20 minutes. Why is it taking you guys so long to set it up in a clinic or hospital? And I'm not joking that people have said this, right? Completely different system, right? In our house, we're just setting it up a little. One access point is for the whole house. Here, we're talking about roaming, connecting from point to point. We're dealing with glass, metal, um, lead, right? If we got a radiology room, all these things that tell wireless stop, you're not gonna work in this region. So uh, not as simple. So don't do that to your folks because it's a much, much more complex issue than just going and doing it like we're, like we're setting it up in our home. Okay, so what do I think the future, and how are we doing on, on time, Ms. Chorba? I just want to make sure I'm not going over time here. And um, so let me talk about the future of uh, telemedicine broadband. This is only me. Some of the things I'm thinking that's coming down the pike here. I think we will eventually have a hospital grade private network, kind of like what we did in the CTN in all 50 states. Then we'll connect to each other, and that way we could avoid the internet altogether, right? I think that's going to make life a lot easier. And, and it's uh, as we're seeing how we're developing this right now in healthcare, it's really proving to be a, a godsend as far as connecting to each other. And I know there's a lot of techs out there go, wait, but the internet keeps getting faster and faster. And I don't think so. I think the internet someday will be fast enough where we don't have this. I think so too. The problem is, is that still, and I read an article a couple weeks ago that plain old telephone systems, so your old phone still in your office, there's still about 90 million of those still using plain old telephone systems that are moving to the internet to switch over to voice over IP. So a lot of these kind of connectivities that are still going to keep constantly jumping onto the internet. So I think as, yes, we're getting faster, we're also going to get slower because a lot more connectivity onto that network, right? So that's going to be a, a major issue there, too, as we move forward. Um, so I think that's where we're really going to see it is these private networks all across the country to be able to do that. I also think cable companies are going to have a significant play, right? Because we're going to be able to connect these private networks to big buildings and hospitals, clinics and hospitals and schools. But getting it to your home is going to be very, very expensive. Well, 
once TV switched from analog, where we could just use a nice little antenna on the roof, uh, to digital, which you could use a, a digital antenna. However, most people switched over to cable providers. Since now we have millions of people on cable, all we have to do is connect these private networks to the cable companies, and instantly we got millions of access to millions of homes, right? So now, whether you're a patient in a home needing to see a doctor or you're a doctor in a home providing that service, those cable companies will be able to provide that service and be able to connect that. I think that's the future where that's going to go to. Let's see how it goes over the next uh, several years. But um, that's uh, it for my, my, my portion of my talk. A couple of the things that I think I want to bring up and, and uh, let you know of is the CTN here in California is having a telehealth summit uh, Monday, April 18th through April 19th in San Diego, and there's a link to it there. And another um, event that I think is really helpful to learn more about what we're talking about here today too as well is the American Telemedicine Association annual conference, and that's happening May 14th through the 17th in Minneapolis. So I always like to give folks where can you get more information besides email and me and the TRC is going to these events are really useful. A lot of courses that will go much more in depth and a lot more time for question and answer section too, right? So here's where I get to take a drink of water and look and see what kind of questions we have here. And I don't know how much time we have for question and answers, but hopefully we could get to them and answer your questions. And you guys can reach me here at, on the uh, address here, dan at caltelhealth.com. Um, or, oh, that's wrong. Let me put that in there wrong. It's dan at caltelhealth.org. So please change that on there. Or you can reach me at dan at telemedicine.com. So whatever's easier for your member, uh, dan at telemedicine.com or dan at te caltelhealth.org.com. That will not work there. Or you could always give me a call. So, so at this Kathy? Point, thank you, Dan. At this point, can you scroll through the next slide for me? Sure. So we'll go through these and then we'll do we'll questions. Go through, okay, go perfect. The next few slides and then we'll get to the question and answer because I'm, there are three wonderful questions I'd like Dan to take a peek at. And before we do that, I'd like to remind everybody the National Telehealth Webinar Series is the third Thursday of every month. Our next webinar will be the extension for community healthcare outcomes. As most of you know, it is Project Echo, and that's hosted by the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center, which will be offered on Thursday, April 21st, and I do believe registration will be open soon. Okay, is that our last slide there, Daniel? Uh, I think you had one more. Oh, it's like the Kathy and Dan show. Yes, <laughs> we should do this weekly. We'll do this weekly. <laughs> so, and, and of course, your opinion of this webinar is, is extremely valuable to us. So if you could please participate in the brief uh, brief survey that is listed on your screen by SurveyMonkey, we would be most most appreciative. Unless you didn't like this talk. Unless then. you didn't like the talk, then, <laughs> then you can just you no, know, log off right I would now. Love to hear so from let's everybody. let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and get to get to the question. All right, let's turn that around. Let's take a look at some of these and uh, that's probably an idea to make a network of private network. Ah, okay. So a question came up. Um, I thought MPLS uses a public internet and not by itself is a pub private network. Is this uh, correct? Then would that not mean that the MPLS network is a public internet? How did you make your network private? Well, MPLS stands for multi-protocol label switching. And so what we were able to do is we actually contracted with, uh, went out to bid. So I guess I could say AT&T won the bid to be able to do this in the state of California. And all of those connections and connectivities between all of our sites and our backbone is none of it is over the internet. It actually is directly connected over private connectivity between those different locations. And what we generally do is how do we get it from the hospital and clinic to our backbone? That each hospital and clinics I had to decide what speed did they want to our backbone. So we gave them everything from a choice from uh, one megabit all the way up to 100 megs that they could connect up. And that was the type of circuit. The barrier there was, especially for our rural folks, were, is that um, in order to go above 10 megs, for the most part on the rural side, we had to bring in fiber. And if fiber was not available, and I got to tell you, majority of the state of California is very, very rural. Anybody wanted greater than that really couldn't do that unless 
the central office that was close to them had fiber to them, then we could use what's called fast ethernet and be able to connect up. But our max distance between those central offices is around 11,000 feet for a little bit less than two miles away. If they're further than that, then that was the max speed they were able to get. Uh, let's see this next one. How do you connect to remote areas that do not have internet connectivity? Is satellite a solution and financially feasible? Great question. So I've done everything from uh, satellite communication deep in the Amazon in Brazil, Nigeria, South Korea, um, South Africa. Works phenomenally well. The problem is, is the cost. Uh, and the region at which you are uh, located is, can you actually get visual of that, um, where that satellite is in the sky? Meaning if you're in a deep valley and there's mountains on both sides and there's no access to that satellite communication, that's gonna be a barrier there. The other barrier is, is the cost per minute. And if you guys want to, anybody that's interested in doing satellite communication, because we have this issue all the way along the beautiful coast, Highway 1, there's only one fiber link up certain sections of that. And at one point there was somebody backhoeing and ripped into that and all these hospitals and clinics lost connectivity. So we're actually looking at right now to do sat satellite communication, smaller dish, very low cost to be able to have that as a secondary um, connection capability if that were ever to happen again for them. So uh, the other thing is the latency is a little bit greater, right? It's got to go reach all the way up to satellite, come back down to Earth station, then go across to wherever you are. So the funny thing about satellite is you get about a half a second delay, 500 milliseconds. So when you're speaking to somebody, it's almost like that walkie-talkie. You have to wait because there's a pause, and then they start speaking. But once you get used to it, it's really not that barrier. It's kind of like you've seen um, the news, and they go back to you, stand in the office, and they ask a question. Then that reporter's sitting there with the microphone, and you're wondering, why are they taking so long to response? It's because that communication hasn't hit them yet. It's about a half a second. It feels like a lifetime, but once you get it uh, used to it, it's, it's no barrier. But great question. All right. Uh, did Telemedicine and Ecom have to create the backbone net system with better connectivity? If so, how? Also, do all states have similar type of backbone ready in place? You know, um, this wasn't a telemedicine.com piece. Uh, this was actually started with the University of California, Davis. When the FCC uh, said, hey, we've got some money available for innovative projects using broadband. While actually, uh, Kathy and I were still at the university, um, Dr. Nesbitt applied for a grant uh, to be able to do this. It was very interesting. There's only about three or four of us in a, in a room uh, like this with a whiteboard, and Dr. Nesbitt said, hey, if we got millions of dollars, what would we possibly do? And the first thoughts were, hey, if we can create our own network where hospitals and clinics wouldn't have to deal with this issue, any like that would be fantastic. And that's how the C10 was born. He ran with it, got applied for the grant, it went out. Uh, I had left the university, so I didn't get to see it come to fruition at that point. Uh, after I left and started telemedicine.com, I came back after the CTN was developed and Eric Brown set up here, hey, Dan, come work with us and help us with the CTN. And it's been fantastic because I get to see it firsthand how the nightmare was. It was our Achilles heel in telemedicine to be able to do communication over the internet to now flawless connectivity to be able to connect up to each other and be able to do that. Uh, and so that's, so the other question was, do you, are other states doing that? Yes. Unfortunately, um, there's only a couple doing it as big as we are. Oh, I have to say, and I don't know for a fact, but I think almost every one of the 50 states applied for some type of grant when the FCC released that money, but not as robust and as large as ours. But I think there's one or two, I think, was it uh, Colorado? I can't remember that also did that. Where was that? I believe it's Idaho. Idaho, maybe. Yeah, but all the others, really not nothing as large as we have. Ken, okay, here's another question. How are we doing on time? Okay, great. So can repeaters improve signal for most situations almost as well as wired connections? Hmm, okay. That is a great question. So just to clarify, 
what is a repeater? So folks that are listening to this might not know what a repeater is. So I've got a wireless access point and it's this phone and it's sending out a wireless signal and here I am with my computer here and it's being able to connect to that. If I go too far away and it can't feel or connect to this access point that's sending out that wireless signal, I need to put in what's called a repeater. And it's another box like this sitting here that talked to this one. And now daisy chains it and sends that signal further out and more distant. Yes, it can greatly improve the quality. However, you still, I still recommend a spectrum analysis of that network to make sure that network connectivity as well as the channels it's communicating on. Because a lot of times people use too much communication protocols like for those of you who have seen the vocera which is the little thing where you could talk to each other on the thing you wear around your neck it goes over your wi-fi network so if you remember back to that slide where i talked about utilization that is one of the other key pieces look on your wireless network because a lot of hospitals and clinics go hey we're going to give guest wireless access to folks that are waiting in our waiting room so they could watch movies or surf the web or whatever else and they use that as the same Wi-Fi network that they're doing all these other things. So the your utilization could be totally impacted like that freeway that is just totally congested. And then it's not going to work so great, right? So look at your utilization of your Wi-Fi. Use a repeater. Spectrum analysis to make sure that not only the channel between those access points and the repeaters are using, uh, uh, communicating on the correct channel that should be in the area because other hospitals or clinics or homes might be using that channel and you get interference, a lot of those things you should look at. Okay, do I recommend Link or Skype uh, for small behavioral health clinics? The first thing I always do with anything is HIPAA compliance, right? So the first thing you gotta be able to do is can I actually encrypt this in cap capability and be able to do that? That's the first thing you need to be aware of. The other thing is, like any other cloud service, you don't have control over this. What, I, what do I mean by that? Kind of like that slide, the doctor will may see you in a couple minutes or not at all. If that server goes down, who do you call? Do you call your guys and go, hey, when are we going to back up? Can we switch to something else? So in actuality, I would, I, you know, I, I would probably, and I don't want to get sued, so I would look at other cloud service providers and compare them to not only of number one, connectivity of how good does it look at all those different times that we talked about not only from your site but the sites you're going to be supporting in mental health but then um, I would also look at can I encrypt that information between those two locations and if I'm only connecting to one I'd also look at me can I do a direct connection between that if you can't then uh, the cloud service great way to go but do that due diligence before you sign a contract and move forward with that Okay, uh, let's see. What about dual band routers? Great question. It's quad band routers and all these different things. What does that actually mean? Um, it means it could talk on different, not only frequencies, but different prototypes of connectivity. Ooh, that's my marker saying we're out of time, but I will finish this question. Um, and you have multiple antenna capability, which is dual diversity and quad diversity, and you got all these antennas. The benefit of that is just like no different than your radio in your, remember our days of having radio, and when you couldn't hear the radio station and all of a sudden you pulled up the antenna, and hey, you can hear that radio station much better. Uh, same type of process works within um, wireless communication. So if you have dual band, better band. However, a lot of folks think that the higher the frequency, the better that is as far as between floors. And it actually works the opposite. The lower the frequency, uh, it actually works better between floors because it's got better penetration rate. But higher the frequency on those higher frequency bands work better line of sight, a lot longer distances. So something you should definitely talk to with your wireless provider and talk about uh, as far as the dual um, band uh, routers you have in place. And that's where the spectrum analysis comes into play as far as doing that and being able to communicate that piece. So I think uh, I will bring up our connection here because I can't see if this Kathy's in our shot here. I, I assume you are. Well, I'm, well I'm, actually, I'm right here. Okay. Thank you, Dan. And I'd like to thank everyone for asking the wonderful questions. As, as you could tell, Dan can talk for hours, and oftentimes he does. <laughs> especially when people have really good questions. 
So I, I do thank you for attending today, and I do invite you to attend every one of our monthly seminar series, which are just as fantastic as, as today has been. Dan Kurichek from telemedicine.com and from the California Telehealth Network, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And if you do have further questions, you can always, you can always uh, see Dan at our uh, Telehealth Summit in California coming up middle April in San Diego. So if you're in the mood to travel to sunny San Diego mm. in middle April, we welcome It's beautiful. You. It's on the beach. And, oh, yes, that's right. Yes. It's beautiful. It's on the beach. And we have wonderful events planned that are that are um, both academic and, and for fun. So thank you once again. And Becky, I'll turn this over to you. And please do remember to fill out your survey and contact us if you do have questions. Our website is caltelehealth.org or caltrc.org. Thank you. Thank you all.